Hello everyone, this is uh, Dr. Saud Anwar. Today is the 12th of April, 2020. I wanted to give an update on the treatment. We have learned a lot since the last time um, I put a presentation on the treatment and I think it's uh, worth having a discussion again and then also going a little deeper. A lot of what we understood in the past um, may have changed at this time. So I think it's worthy to have a, a discussion about this with the understanding that what we know today may not be accurate in about a week from now with the fluidity of this illness, the disease and the severity, um, we are looking at a lot of information. And uh, I wanted to start uh, by saying that and, and with humility that uh, a lot of what we are hearing and what a lot we are learning about um, is, is important. It's worthy of a consideration but then you start to look at the facts and then that's what I'm going to try to use in the conversation today and also some of the published literature. So COVID-19 using a case study. So I'm going to use a case study of an individual whose physiology I have understood and worked with so then I can feel more comfortable speaking about it, but then recalibrate the treatments uh, according to what we understand and uh, uh, using the physiologic guidance to navigate the confusion and the maze that we are in. Again, disclaimers, this is based on experience, not necessarily evidence. However, uh, there are studies that I'm going to be talking about, but the studies are literally coming every single day. So I can tell you that what I'm speaking of right now is up to date from uh, up to the 12th of April. Um, there are many theories that are floating around at different levels and timings of the disease. And I think I will try to help navigate some of those theories. Uh, some of them uh, may not be fully accurate and I want to speak to them with some facts on, on some of the data. And then uh, recommendations are likely to continue to change. And of course, I do not have any financial benefit from any of the pharmaceutical recommendations that I'm making. And uh, um, in this particular case that I'm going to study, there are no identifiers and I'm obviously abiding by the HIPAA laws and there's uh, not much detail that would help you identify the person. Uh, with that, I am going to move forward with the case. This is about a male uh, whose age is between 40s to 50s, relatively young, uh, no previous lung disease, has history of hypertension, diabetes, underlying obesity, has been a smoker and it's worthy to mention that smokers are 14 times more likely based on the Chinese data to get major complications. So people who are out there, they may want to lose weight, they may want to stop smoking, that'll help them. Um, person came in with fever, cough and shortness of breath. That was the presentation. Um, and then this uh, is the x-ray. If you look at the x-ray, you will see uh, there clearly is a challenge uh, in this particular patient. You're seeing some infiltrates, haziness that you're seeing in the part of the lung, and you're seeing an infiltrate in the right side here. You're seeing an infiltrate on the right side here. Maybe some suggestion of an infiltrate towards the left medial side and lateral as well. So we're seeing some patterns of the infiltrate. This patient was uh, subsequently showing um, the CAT scan uh, confirmed some of these findings. Now with the CAT scan, I think it's uh, important to talk about these air bronchograms. So we are seeing air bronchograms. So there is an alveolar component to the infiltrates that we are seeing, and I'll show you more. But then there is the other pattern that you're seeing, which is very hazy in some of these patients, which is important to, to keep in mind. Um, this is again, we are seeing the air bronchograms. This is an air bronchogram. You're seeing another air bronchogram over here as well and the infiltrates are quite dense and they're they're lighter infiltrates but this is quite dense infiltrate at this time um, the patient on the next day the infiltrates are progressively worsening the patient's oxygenation is progressively worsening uh, disease is asymmetrical at this time more disease towards the right than the left side uh, which is important to be kept in mind in this case and on the 27th the patient is obviously getting worse you're seeing that the infiltrates have progressed to much more significant. The right side again is more than the left, but both sides are getting impacted uh, at that time with the oxygenation and the work of breathing increasing for the patient and the trajectory that he was on. Um, it was decided to intubate the patient early. The patient had been on a high amount of oxygen, uh, was uh, 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 worsening. Now um, we know that it's a good idea to wait as long as we can. Some of these cases, we need to have high flow nasal oxygen to be considered before intubation is a consideration in these patients uh, to buy ourselves more time and then see if we can change 
the trajectory, but high flow oxygen is, is something that we can use and we can prone the patient even before intubation. The patient was intubated. You can see that the ET tube is in good position. And when you, uh, people are uh, being intubated, they actually get a central line as well. So they got a central line right off the bat. And then we got an arterial line as well. But you're seeing that the infiltrates are progressing uh, rapidly in this case, in a matter of hours, the infiltrate bilaterally are increasing and the person has a, a worsening of the interstitial process. So this is a, a situation which is rapidly worsening in this particular case. So um, th this is again the x-rays over the last many days. And, and, and if you look at uh, the 25th, 26th, 27th, and then 27th with the intubation. This was the x-ray that we had seen. And then you're seeing on the 28th as well. So this is a, just a picture of all the various x-rays and I will go into the details of the, the changes that have happened over time. And then you will see that it's gotten worse, it's gone better, it's gone worse, back and forth multiple times. And there's a truly um, depth of information and rationale for each and every one of these changes that I want to look at from a broader perspective that is going to help us uh, hopefully navigate some of these patients in a better organized uh, fashion. So, so listening through this conversation, if you have not seen a patient, even if you have seen a patient, is worthy because I'm, I'm hoping to touch on some areas that are going to help us identify. If you look at the x-ray uh, from about the 10th, you see that the infiltrates and the haziness is much, much worse over here. And I'll explain to you about this reason for that as well. And then you see that suddenly it's improved. Uh, you're seeing a pattern of improvement, but then you start to see again worsening and then the worsening progresses. So every aspect we will try and analyze and then go over the depth of it. This is the various labs and I've tried to put them all together from the various dates. This is again albumin levels from March 25th to 28th. Uh, when we see the traditional bacterial sepsis, the, the albumin drops very rapidly and very significantly. Uh, while the albumin has dropped in this case, I can tell you that the level of depth or drop of albumin has not been as significant as we would see in the bacterial sepsis. So that's something that I, I felt I'd, I'd mentioned to you. Uh, the blood sugars remain a challenge and it's important to have obsessive control of the blood sugars. If we can, we know that's going to help in the improvement, but it's it's a fighting situation because of the the depth and, and uh, the impact that that illness has and the stress on the body. So I think I wanted to put that out there as well for uh, blood sugar. C-reactive protein. Uh, this is a pretty fascinating part, and I think we will discuss about this going forward. But the C-reactive protein was sky high on the 27th. That's when the patient's condition is literally on fire, when we're seeing that the disease and illness has taken complete control. And then from the 28th, it dropped very significantly. And this is something I will talk about. And this is the time when I gave the patient tocilizumab, um, and then that actually helped. But then it's starting to go upwards again. That's something to keep in mind. The other thing is the D-dimer. The D-dimer was not as high initially, but then started to climb to 10,000 plus range. And then it's continued on and then precipitously started to decrease. I will talk about that as well. And then this is part of the physiologic changes that are happening that important to know that there is a world of things that are happening in the body at that time. And it's worthy to uh, see at what stage, what can be used to try and address these difficult challenges. So ferritin levels were very high, 11,000 plus, and then started to come down, but they've been slowly decreasing and there's not been that much of a variation in it, but there was a significant improvement from a 4,000 down to a 1,500 back on a few days at a gradual reduction that was happening. Fibrinogen has been on the higher side, but not significant variations, at least in this particular case. Um, and then we have absolute lymphocyte count. It was on the lower side and it started to improve and then it went down low. So it has it had its ups and downs and it's important to keep track of it because that has some um, impact on the patient's uh, condition. Uh, this is the LDH. LDH in the beginning has been sky high on these patients as well. Very, very significantly elevated, especially in the beginning of the illness when the patient was getting worse and then it has slowly gradually been coming down with bumps of increasing as well. Uh, LDH can be followed closely and that actually gives an insight into uh, the impact and the injury that uh, is happening inside the body.
Bicarbonate, thankfully, did not have many changes. Uh, this was because we are ahead of the curve in this patient. Thankfully, multi-organ failure was controlled by giving significant amount of fluids, protecting the patient from the renal insufficiency, and, and, and we were able to try to get ahead of uh, uh, ourselves from protection perspective in this situation. And this is the PTT, and then this is actually basically showing that uh, around uh, the 8th of April, we uh, started to give IV heparin, and then this was the intravenous heparin. I will explain to you why and then what that did for the patient as well. And the platelet count was thankfully not very uh, low to begin with and has remained well uh, throughout this uh, entire spectrum. And that's a uh, useful information to, to look at as well. And the WBC count uh, again had been on the lower side. That's a classic pattern. It started to go up. It went up quite a bit at one point, the third. And, and we will talk about this part as well and why did it go up and what happened at this particular time. Um, and uh, then it started to come down after that. And this is, of course, uh, uh, proof that this was a COVID-19 patient. And this is a ventilator settings at different times. There is value in this conversation. Uh, the patient was on 100% oxygen uh, with a very um, high amount of PEEP. The PEEP was at 15 and, and then was uh, being slowly and gradually decreased down. The P, this was a PEEP responsive situation. Again, this is something that's worthy of conversation. There's a lot of uh, uh, people out there who are saying that this is not even ARDS and don't treat it like ARDS. And I think it's important to uh, work with the physiology, work with the facts, work with some of that information before we come up with theories and, 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 and uh, with, with strategies uh, uh, that may not be as effective. But I think it's important to put all of those things uh, uh, in front of uh, the clinicians out there. The temperature, uh, it was 102 when we saw the patient initially, and then it had rapidly decreased. And this rapid decrease was when the patient was given tocilizumab. And I will go into the depth of this, and the patient's temperature started to go up after about a few days of tocilizumab that was given, uh, and then had another bump of that as well with the temperature curve. The temperature is of value if you are on any other medications. IV fluids that patient received, that the fluid overload is this important aspect. I have this out there and I'll explain to you why this is relevant as well. So I'm putting all of the data from a broader perspective of this patient management so that we can look at the broader picture and see the patterns and see what helps and what doesn't help. This is the medications. Uh, keep in mind the patient received the TOSI on the uh, 27th. Uh, that is important. Uh, the patient also obviously didn't need sedation and the heparin was given sub-Q from day one. This is the right thing to do for prevention, but the therapeutic dose was given early and then, uh, sorry, late. And this was on the 8th that we gave the IV heparin that uh, you can see here. And I will explain to you that uh, the patient obviously needed some of the medications. The anti-infective treatment was used. Um, as well, and, and we also needed to use the patient uh, uh, a TPN at one point because the patient was unable to tolerate tube feeding as, as well. So word about tocilizumab, and I think uh, this is uh, the, uh, the medicine that is going to have an impact on interleukin-6. Um, it is important to recognize that the cytokine storm has an impact on the disease process and changes things. So we give the medicine on the the 27th, and I touched on this earlier, when we did give the medicine, the temperature dropped very rapidly and improved significantly. So that is a sign that the inflammation was blocked with the TOSI in this particular case. And I have some more evidence going forward. If you look at the C-reactive protein, the C-reactive protein was very high. And as the C-reactive protein was high, we saw that after TOSI was given about literally 24 to 48 hours later, a significant drop in the C-reactive protein. Now, the, while the C-reactive protein was coming down, the patient did not have any change in the D-dimer. The D-dimer continued to go upwards. Important piece of information, please keep this in the back of your mind because this will become relevant. There are multiple different things that are happening into the physiology of these patients. And, and that's why you need to have a strategy for each part. So it's almost like the enemy is attacking you from different angles and you need to have a strategy for each one of those. And, and, and so, so when you have the interleukin-6 hitting you with a cytokine, use the tocilizumab, the C-reactive protein, which is a marker of the inflammatory disease, can have an impact. While the D-dimer is a reaction to an inflammatory and acute phase reactant, 
if it is not following the path that it should, then there's something cooking that we need to be aware of. Uh, the absolute lymphocyte count, which is associated with the better prognosis if it is on the higher side. So right off the bat, you start to see a pattern where the, into the, this absolute lymphocyte count started to improve with tocilizumab. And then it flattened down, down it decreased, and then it decreased down further after some time. The tocilizumab is in the system for about good uh, 7, 10 days or so, but, but sometimes you need a higher dose of this. So I, I think it's worthy to keep uh, these things in perspective. Uh, the ferritin, uh, again, was very high. The ferritin started to decrease. It is also part of the acute phase reactant, but there could be more than one reason for the fibrinogen and the ferritin to be impacted by the fire. The ferritin started to decrease in this point after the treatment. The LDH also showed a decrease in the, the path as well. The LDH was in the 1900 range and decreased down after a few days down to 900 and then continued to decrease after that. So the LDH has a value as well. And then the LDH had a little bump around the, the seventh. Uh, and then we will keep that in, in our conversation. This is the X-ray on the 27th that I showed you. The ET tube was in place and the infiltrates were progressively uh, worsening and then increasing bilaterally. After the intubation, the next day on the 28th, the patient did have uh, um, the, the PEEP that had the short sort of uh, made it clear that the right lower lung infiltrate had cleared up a little bit and improved. That is because of the high positive and expiratory pressure more than anything else. But uh, it's important to, to see that the oxygenation was evidence of improvement however we gained ground and we lost ground and and, and this is the time when you're using high FiO2 and you have to start to uh, work on proning the patients as well because the proning helps uh, uh, the oxygenation in some of these cases now we have known the proning effect and impact for a long time it has been a standardized way of managing ARDS patients it is the ARDS patients that get better with the proning process uh, we have known this for many, many years. Again, on the 30th, uh, uh, you're seeing the pattern of oxygenation and infiltrates remain progressive and significant as well. So a word about tocilizumab, and I think uh, it, this is published on the 6th of April, 2020, a journal of me medical virology. Um, this is about the monoclonal antibody interleukin-6 uh, antibody against interleukin-6 as a consideration for cytokine storm. Um, it is discussed the treatment response for the tocilizumab therapy in COVID-19 patients. So this was published recently and it just shows some interesting aspect. Bottom line is that shows that tocilizumab appears to be an effective treatment option in COVID-19 patients with a risk of cytokine storms. So, so right now when a person is going to be at a storm, you see that the pattern, you have to consider this option. Um, and for critically ill patients with IL-6 levels to be high now, my challenge is that not all hospitals have IL-6 as readily available. It is a sent out test for many of the hospitals and it takes a long time to things to get better, to get back. And in that situation, you're better off having a strategy to use other ways of assessing the, the storm. Whether it's your white cell count, it is your C-reactive protein, it's your LDH. All of them are going in the ferritin too in some respects. These will be giving you guidance about the cytokine storm in the absence of actual hands-on interleukin-6 levels. And you have to also keep in mind that repeat dose of tocilizumab is a reasonable option. So hospitals need to have enough of it available uh, because some of the times it, it's helpful. Now, this is another part is that um, uh, there's been all these conversations about uh, steroids. We, I talked about tocilizumab in my previous conversation. I am going to repeat uh, the fact that tocilizumab has value. It is worthy to try it and continue it. And consideration would be to increase the dose or give another repeat dose if needed. Uh, this is something I did not see in the previous uh, conversation. And uh, the reported predictions of severe prognosis is, of course, the age, the sex, uh, older is a bad prognostic sign, being a male is a bad prognostic sign. We are not doing as frequent CAT scans right now because of the logistical challenges moving these patients and then having to have the CAT scanners be cleaned up after a patient is getting a CAT scan because of the risk of transmission. So we are not doing CAT scans non, uh, like they were doing in China. C-reactive proteins, LDH and lymphocyte count are important pieces of the, the puzzle. Um, and if we are going to use the C-reactive protein and LDH and lymphocyte count, we actually can use them 
as our ways of fighting this with a cytokine storm. This is the patient who's going to worsen if you're seeing these test results to be abnormal. And this is where you actually unleash your capacity to control the cytokine storm. So um, again, the prediction uh, models for this is uh, what, what we have talked about is there's a predictive models that we can create and that has actually been effective. Uh, this has been published and this is way based on some of that. This is a, some just thing that came out and I have mentioned this in this. So uh, beginning of the cytokine storm, it's important to use tocilizumab. Uh, if uh, you need more than one dose, it is okay. Antibiotics are not necessarily indicated if the procalcitonin is not increased. This is a viral disease. This is a viral disease that has gone out of control and completely impacted our immune system and then is creating a reaction which is un, uh, unsustainable when, when it's worse form. It's important to make sure that we treat it as such. But um, secondary bacterial infection, we need to use procalcitonin as a guide rather than use all the antibiotics that we have uh, to try and hit it because that's not where the disease is. We'll end up using more antibiotics. The risk of complications will increase. So use it in a manner where it is going to be relevant. This is something I did not say in the previous part, so important that I'm saying this, which is based on now more data and more recognition of what's out there. The steroids uh, short course of solimedrol, 40 milligrams IV BID for three to four days in the beginning and the time of the cytokine storm is a reasonable thing. This is going to actually impact your uh, help uh, with the cytokine storm. So I think it's important to look at this option as well. So the people who have made the claim that this is not ARDS, but it's a microthrombotic disease or a high altitude illness like disease, or now I've just received an email from another doctor. He said it's a methemoglobinemia like illness, so you need to treat it differently. So right now the challenge is a lot of people have a lot of theories and a lot of opinions about this disease. And, um, and some of them are very sexy when you hear about them. Uh, the question is, what are the facts around them and what are the physiologic principles around them? So that's why we have to, to talk about it. Any physiologic thing, we have to be able to show it. And, and one thing that I tell my students all the time is your physiology never lies. So you can look at the physiology of the patient and understand those things. And I think I want to answer this question going forward and it will be relevant. This is actually the pulmonary pathology. This was recently published. Um, uh, and, and this is from, from China where they actually had two patients who had lung cancer surgery. And because they had the lung cancer surgery, both of those patients had lung tissue that was uh, the normal tissue around the cancer site. But later these patients were found to have COVID-19 infection and they were able to identify the early phases of the two patients uh, of the ill. So you have the normal tissue uh, and then you have the, the tissue with the um, COVID-19. So histologic changes of case one, you see proteinaceous exudates in the alveolar space with granules. And you're seeing protein globules, you're seeing intraalveolar fibrin with early organization, mononuclear inflammatory cells, hyperplastic pneumocytes, and suspected viral inclusion as well. So this is a textbook case of uh, diffuse alveolar damage in the early phases, which is associated with ARDS. I just want to tell you that this is what we are seeing in the early phases of these patients that uh, were there. And this is the second patient I will show you has similar pattern. His logic patient, and this was evidence, evidence of proteinaceous and fibrinous product, diffuse expansion of alveolar walls, septa with fibroblastic proliferations of type 2 pneumocytes uh, with early diffuse alveolar damage that we were seeing in these patients. Uh, right now and there's proliferative fibroblasts that were there as well. Again, no mention of uh, microthrombi at this time, but we are seeing proteinaceous material on the inside of the alveoli, uh, which is the classic diffuse alveolar damage, which is classic for ARDS. And so if somebody is saying that this is not ARDS, well, um, let's look at the data. This is autopsy uh, re reports from uh, COVID-19 autopsies from Oklahoma. There were three or so cases that were described in this particular study that actually um, came out. Look at the time we are, we are having autopsy studies of three patients as our study nowadays, because uh, hopefully we'll have more data, but this is helpful and relevant to, to look at.
Uh, this was another case of the, the patient, 77 year old who had died from this. Same pattern, you're seeing this diffuse alveolar damage in the acute phases, you're seeing um, uh, alveolar injury. And and, and again, uh, bronchi are, th this has bronchi in it as well. The inflammatory are lymphocytes, uh, this patchy interstitial chronic inflammation. In, in, interstitial inflammatory changes were seen, but you're not seeing the microthrombi, but classic features of ARDS. So important to have that as well. Uh, then the histopathologic study on multiple patients of uh, puncture of remains of three cases of uh, uh, novel coronavirus pneumonia. This is again another Chinese study which had biopsy of some three patients or so and, and uh, important to look at their studies and pathology specimens. You're seeing the same pattern uh, except there in, in one of those areas you're seeing a, a small microthrombus. Let me see where my arrow is. There is my arrow. Okay, so if you see over here, this is the microthrombus in one little area. So now the, the the people who are saying that this is entirely a thrombotic or microthrombotic process, um, there are microthrombi, but there is diffuse alveolar damage. You you cannot have uh, this is not made up. Nobody's made up these pathologic findings on multiple different series that have been out there uh, from China, from United States that we are seeing. Uh, there is presence of diffuse alveolar damage. So that is important to look at it. To say that these patients should not be on ventilators with ARDS is, it, it, it's not accurate. It's better to not put them right off the bat. That is a given, I agree with you. Um, putting them in prone position makes perfect sense. You do it, it's a smart thing to do. Uh, but then saying not to intubate them if uh, they are worthy to be intubated. Well, you're not going to work your way out of an ARDS, which is progressive, unless you have um, magic bullets that you can use. And we will talk about not necessarily magic bullets, but some treatments. But there is microthrombi in one of those studies. So it's, it's worthy to look at it. But I will touch on this topic. It's not a microthrombotic disease all the way, but there is value of having a conversation because it is a hypercoagulable disease. We have learned that at least. So this is again the part of the ARDS and this is uh, look at the, the bilateral alveolar interstitial infiltrates throughout this area. We showed about the bronchograms as well. Somebody was saying these are only interstitial infiltrates. No, they are not. We saw the air bronchograms. So this is a alveolar interstitial infiltrates with diffuse alveolar damage and this is ARDS. And yes, there could be microthrombi. I'm not taking away from your theory, but do not say that this is not ARDS because we are seeing it, the world is seeing it. So let's treat it for that as well, which is a, a treatment of supportive treatment, but you have to fix the disease. You will have the answers to your questions in a little bit. So hang in there. So convalescent plasma treatment, that's another part that I have talked about. There's a talk that you can look at in more detail. But it's important to look at this further. So antibody response to SARS uh, uh, CoV-2 in, in patients with novel coronavirus. This is actually something that uh, is out of China. March 28th was the publication date. I will share some of so you have an idea what we are looking at. Important thing is that it is about day 11 or so when you start to see the IgM and IgG. So that is the part that I think is important to keep in mind that uh, the disease is the, the RNA, you can see that earlier. And then this is actually very effective. This is where you're seeing the responsive and positive answers in this situation. So you're getting 80% or so responsive. So in the first couple of days, you're not getting the answers, but then you can see the RNA to start to show the results. But interestingly, as the time goes by, the RNA becomes less sensitive. And the reason probably is because you're developing antibodies. So this is a fight that's going on. There's an RNA that is actually having an impact on your immune system. The immune system is fighting back and then immune system starts in about day nine or so to produce the antibodies. The antibodies are produced around here. When the antibodies are produced around here, the virus is getting killed and the virus is getting killed. You don't recognize and identify the virus anymore. So this is the war that we are working on and the test will be reflective of it and the treatment would be reflective of the way to help this situation. I wanted to put this slide here because of the timeline and then using, in the absence of too much data right now, using the experience of SARS, the, the SARS-CoV-1, uh, and see if, if we can learn. So 
the median zero conversion time of IgM was day 11, day 12, and day 14. So important to know that it's around the second week or so when the antibodies are starting to be produced by people. Uh, and, and then the RNA detectability, uh, again, people are saying it's a perfect test uh, for the nasal nasopharyngeal. No, it is not. It's 66, 67% accurate sensitivity-wise. And, and the one from the throat is not as effective, uh, but the one from the nasopharyngeal is better. But having said that, uh, uh, we don't want to be putting bronchoscopes in everybody's lungs to be able to identify some of this uh, because of the risks of, associated with it uh, to the patients and also to the, the people doing the procedures. So now uh, the timing, and this is what I wanted to put in there. Now, this is my perspective. Uh, this is that if from day seven to day 11, if signs show that the patient is moderate to severe disease with hypoxia, infiltrates, and respiratory failure, and impending cytokine storm. Remember the cytokine storm that we had talked about, the cytokine storm uh, with the, the C-reactive protein, the LDH, and, and, and uh, uh, fer uh, ferritin being very high. Those are the ones which are going to move in the wrong direction. These patients in the early phases who are showing the reaction from day 7 to day 11 before the antibodies are produced, you have to start to see if you can get the convalescent plasma to them and then be ahead of the curve, ahead of the curve before the cytokine storm hits the patients. But if you are not able to get it during the first 7, so seven to 11 days, later in the, the time as well, when the severe cases, you have to start to use it as well. So again, this is going to be helpful to uh, have an antibody reaction. Now, why am I using this time and time is that uh, rather than saying, well, do it on 20 days or 14 days or, or not, rather than seven to eight days, this is the part. This is actually a uh, uh, part from 2005. So what am I talking about 2005 and 2020? Because SARS had hit us at that time, which is about 85% similar virus with a nasty uh, disease, which was also a killer disease for patients with similar ARDS pattern. What we had learned was that these patients had high LDH and these patients, when they were given uh, with their PCR positive and zero negative for SARS, which means that the antibodies were not positive and their antibodies were uh, not positive, but their RNA was positive, they had a far better outcome by a very significant margin. So I'm using the same principle. I don't have the luxury of the current data for the same thing because there's no randomized trial going on right now. So we have an opportunity to learn from the 2005 literature and use the SARS before this zero conversion. But if there is a zero conversion, then you can still use it in, in, in my book. So you can use it, but it's better to it. So this is again the same thing, 61% of the patients with good outcome were PCR positive and zero negative. So just repeating what I just said in one of my previous talks, and I'm just uh, repeating it because this would make sense going forward. Okay, <clears throat> the therapeutic anticoagulation, very important. I think the people who are saying that this is not ARDS, I disagree with you on the part that this is ARDS, but then I agree with you that you need therapeutic anticoagulation. So uh, this is not the politician in me. This is actually based on the facts. So the reality is that it is ARDS. I just explained to you that uh, why it is ARDS. But in one of those areas, we were able to see anticoagulation. And you will like what I'm saying in a second. This is our patient. If you look over here on this, the eighth or so, uh, we had started this patient on IV heparin. Okay, and the patient is getting DVD prophylaxis. That is going on, They're getting the flushes from day one. That's going on. Nobody stopped that. Actually, we are ahead of the curve on that and then being aggressive on the treatment, but we are also not starting the IV heparin. Um, look, uh, again, the PTT went up because we are giving the IV heparin at the time that we did. So that actually confirms the impact of the IV heparin. Um, here's something that you have to look at. If you look at the D-dimer, when the D-dimer of this patient, the C-reactive protein started to come down, the D-dimer, if you look at my earlier part of the conversation today, the D-dimer started to go up, going up, going up, going up. And around this day, I actually, we started the patient on IV heparin and look what happened to the D-dimer in a matter of one day, dropped down significantly. Again, confirms that this is a hypercoagulable condition. I had one of my friends who is a, physi a physiatrist who just texted me just now and he was telling me that he's seen patients with strokes. 
So the hyper and young people, and so hypercoagulable condition is there. Hypercoagulable condition is possibly responsible for the cardiac issues that we have seen. It is also responsible for the pulmonary um, vascular disease that we are seeing, and then also strokes and ischemic changes in the limbs that we are seeing. So look at it as a hypercoagulable condition and treat it with aggressive prevention, but in the absence of contraindication, treat it with full therapeutic intention. This is a mouthful, but, but I'll repeat it so it'll make sense. This is another example. So this is the arterial blood gases. The arterial blood gases that we are seeing is the FiO2. Now I have on the 7th, the same FiO2 and the PEEP is the same as 16. The PCO2 is 64. And when the patient gets IV heparin, the PCO2 goes down the PaO2 goes up. Everything else is more or less the same. And, and, and so hy hypoxemia or oxygenation improves and the dead space part starts to decrease. That is a sign of the improvement. And we are able to reduce the PEEP a little bit going forward. And we were able to keep the vent settings the same way. The patient actually had improved oxygenation, decreased PCO2, and this is a sign of the anticoagulation helping us out. So there is a thrombotic component, it's microthrombi, so the, the spiral CAT scans of the chest aren't picking this up. Ferritin was not helpful, fibrinogen was not helpful to us. So that is again of value. I'm, I'm still in conversation with hematologists to try and understand the, the, the situation with fibrinogen and ferritin in these particular scenarios. Okay, so, so this is uh, another slide I have uh, of, uh, uh, the chest x rays patients, and you're seeing a pattern of uh, improvement, and this is on the 8th. And then look at this part, with the x-rays starting to get pretty worse and significantly worse, and I will tell you the story behind this one. It's important to have that look, looked at as, as well. This is basically fluid overload. Anticoagulation treatment, decreased mortality in severe uh, coronavirus 2019 with disease. This is a journal of thrombosis and homeostasis published on the 27th of March, and this is something that would needs to be looked at. Confirms the part that we had talked about, the patients who are SIC with the, the International Society of Thrombosis, if their platelet count was on the lower side, you do the score. If the score is greater than four, um, you actually should have them on anticoagulation. So the way I would put it is would simplify this even further. This is based on that study, but I think there's an opportunity to simplify this further uh, for management. People have used TPA and that has shown, even though some of these patients did not make it uh, in this particular study, they were like uh, 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 three or four, actually, you know, are seven patients, I, I think, but their, their patients did actually have shown improvement in oxygenation of TPA in some of these patients as well. Um, a difference of coagulation fact features with severe pneumonia induced by SARS-CoV-2 and non-SARS-CoV-2. This is important study shows that uh, even though when the heparin was started, when the patients with D-dimer was greater than 10, you're starting to see a statistically significant improvement in survival in the patients as uh, in 28-day survival. So you have mortality on this side, the 28-day mortality, and you have the D-dimer level. So the D-dimer correlation is valuable. I am doing D-dimers every single day on patients, initially every 12 hours to see the pattern and direction. And now when the D-dimer is starting to move in the wrong direction, you can actually go ahead and start the heparin as a therapeutic dose uh, in those patients and then get ahead of it. And if you're seeing other signs of thrombosis, careful use of TPA is a consideration. People use 25 milligrams. And, and after the study that I had shown from China, they were saying if they had a, to do it all over again, they would use 50 milligrams. No other data available, but this is just a suggestion um, at this time, but there is enough data to say that heparin should be used. So hematologic issues, again, uh, this is a hypercoagulable state. All patients should be on DVD prophylaxis. If the D-dimer is greater than 10, uh, inoxaparin prophylaxis. If no contraindication, early therapeutic treatment is a reasonable option. Uh, this is again my way of looking at it. So, so in the absence of some data, you're looking at it. If digital ischemia and progressive uncontrolled hypoxemia, TPA is an option, but that's the time you want a hematologist to be on board with you and hematologist who is experienced in this aspect because many of the times they would say, hey, don't do this. But the issue is 
what else do we do at that time? Ferritin, if it's greater than 100,000, ask for hematology consult. If there's a DIC-like picture, and some of them will have DIC-like picture, you need a hematologist, but the DIC is gonna be more thrombotic because even the renal failure that we're seeing in these patients is more thrombotic uh, renal failure. So keep that in mind. Anticoagulation, anticoagulation worthy. Some of the issues that we cannot forget about, important to keep in mind, uh, fluid status, secondary bacterial infections, and aspiration pneumonia, and, and, and many other things. So I put that out there as well. So aspiration pneumonia, I wanted to put this out there. This is on the third. The patient uh, had a big infiltrate asymmetrical towards the left side. These patients are placed on prone positioning. They are getting tube feeding. And, and, and with the tube feeding, and they're not actually uh, able to uh, tolerate the tube feeding, you put them in prone position, there's going to be risk for aspiration. That is a secondary impact prevention strategy is going to be important. And then this is actually you're seeing the aspiration pneumonia progress the next. And then it started to show evidence of improvement. This is on the sixth. Um, that you saw that it's improved. So you can see with the blood gases as well, so the second and then third, the patient had to be back on 100% oxygen. Saturation is getting decreased. PEEP is 20 at pretty high. And then on the fifth, when the patient is starting to show evidence of improvement, the initial chemical pneumonitis started to show evidence of improvement and the oxygenation started to improve and we were back on track. Um, this is something um, is a high risk in, in our prone patients as well. So we have to have strategies to watch for it and, and follow this closely and then make sure we protect the patients. Fluid overload is, a, is an challenge that have to be looked at. I want to just show you that because these patients are hypotensive, you start to give them fluid, they're positive, positive because we have no luxury because the blood pressure is low and then the patient is positive quite a bit and then you actually start to diurese them. There's intermittent diuresis, but as soon as you have some luxuries, you start to diurese and there's a significant diuresis causing an improvement that you can see. So this is on the ninth that we had seen. This is the time the anticoagulation is kicking in. So you have like multiple different things happening at the same time. So you have to tease out each one of them to be able to have a man management strategy. And this on the 10th, you're seeing the whitening out of the lungs far more. Now, this is different from the ARDS. Now, this is the challenge. You've got same appearance from ARDS, you have same appearance from fluid overload, and you have a and anticoagulation needs at the same time, but that's where your 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 clinical t uh, assessment, your ventilator pressure assessment, and the lab tests are going to help guide you through this. And then after the diuresis, boom, we are back in the game. Uh, oxygenation is showing evidence of improvement further, and the infiltrates are the bilateral infiltrates started to improve. Patient at three liters out. Uh, this is something, uh, it, it's an interesting perspective. I think it's important to keep in mind based on the CT scan uh, that uh, the Chinese uh, uh, clinicians and the radiologists had put the disease into different phases, into early phase, progressive phase, severe phase, and also dissipative uh, phase. And I think this is value in this. Uh, we are not looking at the disease in the way um, we could potentially look at. And then using some of this information, I'm putting my uh, thoughts and, and, and putting it into the following manner that, okay, if the phases of the illness is going to be in the early progressive severe and the dissipative phase, uh, we have to start to look at this, the two parts. There's a severity of the illness. Uh, so this is again, severity of the illness. We know so far that a number of patients thankfully will be asymptomatic and majority of the patient will have mild disease thankfully, and then some of them will have moderate and their severe disease. So this is a severity based classification. The one with moderate to severe disease, we can divide them into phases of the illness, including the early phase and the progressive phase and the severe phase. The job that we have to do is in the dissipative phases, then when the severe phase, we have fixed that, it starts to go away, thankfully, and starts to improve. And it does happen. I have seen it. So, and I'm excited to tell you that there is uh, hope and there is going to be improvement. This is where the money is. The progressive phase is where our early intervention is going to protect us from the severe phase. And if we can change this and move this back into the mild disease, we are going to be able to do well. And this is where a lot of our resources and efforts and identification needs to be spent. So um, how do we put all of this together? Well, there's a prevention treatment. People talk about the prevention treatment. And, and right now, look, if there's nothing that's going to harm you, you can be on prevention treatment. 
Uh, again, I don't think hydroxychloroquine has reached a point to be on prevention treatment, at least in my mind. So it's a good idea not to be on it. I don't use it. I see the patients and, and, I, and a lot of my friends and associates who ask me, I don't use that. Vitamin C and vitamin D reasonable. Cod liver oil is reasonable. Zinc is reasonable. Um, and uh, L-arginine. Now you tell me if uh, you ask me, show me the data. I have zero data to show any of these things. Uh, to be able to say what I said. However, there is no negative side to it. So therefore, it's probably reasonable to have that option. I'll leave it at that. I will get about 20 people who will send emails about all sorts of different things, what they feel are going to be effective. Simple thing is protect yourself, prevent yourself, build up your immunity, remain well, before, and then that's going to help you be in a better place. However, if somebody develops this illness, and uh, I want to put one point is, that you have the illness and you actually have the nasopharyngeal swab, this is the time you should have a type and screen of blood and have the consents. This is for, for clinicians, but also for the patients who may be listening. The reason is that let's say you are positive, and if you're positive, we need to know your blood type because you will hopefully get better. You will get better. Overwhelming majority of the data is in your favor. But when you get better, your serum your plasma is going to be gold because about 11 days onwards you're going to develop the antibodies and when you're negative from the pcr for the nasal swab and your blood tests are positive for the antibodies we will need you to be strong and well and hydrated so you can donate your blood and we will reach out to you based on your blood and screen and then you should have the consent right there and then because you would not only be able to be well yourself, but you can save other people's lives. So I wanted to put it out there for people to do the type and screen right off the bat and then get the consent to be able to reach out to the patients when the time is right. So this is again in the mild disease. And this is where you are actually watching them and confirming them and resting them and they're improving. But let's say they move towards from mild to moderate disease. And the mild to moderate actually is with the, with the oxygen requirements and hypoxemia. And this is when you need the, to monitor and trend the labs. And this is what I talked about was that we have to have a strategy where we start to streamline the patients and identify the ones where we need to intervene early to try and take care of them early. So we get the D-dimers, we get the C-reactive protein, we get the LDH, ferritin, fibrinogen, antibody test as well, the procalcitonin. If the procalcitonin is high, you need antibacterial treatment. If it is low, which most of them are, you don't do not necessarily need the procalcitonin. <clears throat> Troponin, if you have cardiac issues, PT, PTT, chest x-ray, and blood gases. If you are a high-risk patient uh, with over the age of 60, you have a high BMI, the people who are obese have been identified to be a higher risk, you have immune weakness, you have heart disease or lung disease, and you have bilateral infiltrates, you would be looked at a person who is going to move in the wrong direction. You need to be closely watched and managed in, in that manner. So when you move from there to moderate to severe disease, and, and that is again moving towards the next phase for progressive disease phase, um, then um, you need oxygenation, and that's where you actually try to give them the oxygen that a person needs. You need to be prone positioning the patients with high flow nasal oxygen so that you cannot, um, you can avoid intubation. And if you can turn things around with treatment, that's going to be a good thing. Appropriate fluid. So fluid is a challenge in these patients. Giving too much is not good. Giving too little is not good. You need to have renal protection, kidney protection. And if the respiratory failure, you need to actually have respiratory failure with ventilation uh, with the ARDS strategy, but uh, making sure that you are giving them uh, protective lung volumes. Too much lung volumes are not good. Some of my patients, this patient actually had a higher volume than I would have liked, but uh, that was uh, uh, done. Proning may be needed. You need to control the blood sugars. These are the things that we need to focus on at that time. From the treatment point of view, I, I just talked about the convalescent plasma tocilizumab, and then that's important to have that, and do it more than once if you need to. And, and this should be steroids that we give these individuals, give them DVT prophylaxis and anticoagulation, and use procalcitonin for antibiotics as well, and that's going to be important. Um, hydroxychloroquine that we have been giving, Zithromax that we have been given, now there's some data, I think maybe in a day or two, New England Journal is going to publish a data that uh, I'm not sure is public right now, which will show that the chloroquine is not as effective as we thought in a, a better trial at this time. But uh, um, the way I see this is that uh, it's going to be an emotional issue for a lot of people. If there's no QT interval issue, you treat it with that. I, it's not the end of the world. A lot of people emotionally feel vitamin C is important. I say there's no danger. Please use it. Uh, and then secondary bacterial infections. Think of the disease phases. Important to look at it in phases, actually. 
the patients who will need um, the progressive phase needs a lot of hands-on work to try and protect that progressive phase in moving into the severe phase. And then that's where you need to have a strategy in place and then use a lot of uh, challenges. And, and when you have the severe phase, you still need a lot of work, but that work includes prevention of complications, making sure the kidneys are protected. If kidneys are impacted, you are losing ground. If heart is hurt, you're losing ground. Timing is important. You need to actually have two weeks or so. Fight the fight for two to three weeks if necessary, if you can, and the body allows you to do it, and that may be in the position to help them. Reintubation risks are high in these patients. Make sure they are well nourished as well. So, so this is a, a way I would look at on the 12th of April uh, 2020 to start to look at the treatments. Things are changing every single day, but it's, it's a starting point, again, to look at what we could do better. We are far better than where we were before. Patients do get better, they, they do improve. There's a lot of theories, a lot of data out there. Some of that may be noise, but starting to look from the noise, publications and data information, things are taking a better shape right now. So stay strong, keep fighting the fight, uh, protect yourselves, and, and we are going to win. We have no choice, and stay well. Thank you.